Um, as previously was mentioned, uh, we both volunteer for PANCAN, which is a national organization um, for pancreatic cancer in uh, the United States. Um, and so it's been really quite nice to present with Maria. Um, and uh, so she'll be ad advancing the slides. We did um, thought, we, we thought that it would be kind of nice to um, provide three breaks uh, throughout our presentation, um, allowing for questions. Um, so that'll be um, after about the first 16 slides or so, and then um, at another point, and then finally at the end. So um, we hope to engage um, all of you uh, as much as possible. Next slide, please. So I, I think I'm probably preaching to the choir <laughs> about the benefits of nutrition um, therapy for patients with pancreatic cancer. Um, you know, I, I think when we meet, meet patients for the first time, as well as caregivers, um, a lot of what I project is the goal is, goal is weight maintenance. So maintaining weight, I don't care what size the patient is, whether they're obese or very thin, we know that um, maintaining weight, maintaining good nutrition means that they're going to respond better to treatment. They're going to suffer much less uh, treatment toxicity. Their recovery, of course, is going to be enhanced and um, quality of life is so much better as well. Uh, caregiver support is instrumental. Um, I, often when I meet patients, um, caregivers are the ones that provide so much of the information that I need. Sometimes patients just don't want to talk about nutrition. Um, they're inundated with it at home um, from other providers about the importance of nutrition. So the care, caregivers are wonderful to connect to. The booklet, Diet and Nutrition, um, is actually written by Maria and it is free, um, it's provided, uh, it is really focuses just on pancreatic cancer, so it is unique. Um, it's free through pancan.org, um, so um, just wanted to pay tribute to that. Next slide, please. So like I said, we're, you know, we're hoping to sort of um, give you a variety of um, information today with a focus on um, enzymes and what we refer to as pancreatic extracrine insufficiency. Talk a little bit about some of the strategies for symptom management that Maria will go through. Um, address some of the frequently um, asked questions that we have at the end if, if there's time. Um, our slide deck, I believe, will be available um, uh, to patients or to caregivers at the end of the presentation, so you'll have a lot of these resources. Next slide. So um, really important to, you probably have, you know, read about this or have been told about the role of the pancreas, but I can't tell you how many patients that I speak to who forget about what do enzymes do and how are they different than insulin? Um, it comes to mind of a patient that um, actually had a total pancreatectomy and of course needed to use insulin and pancreatic enzymes to assist her. Um, so obviously two different roles that enzymes help to digest food that's transported into the bloodstream, whereas insulin really helps for the transfer of glucose from the blood to the cells. And um, we'll give you a little bit of schematic um, illustration in the next slides ahead. Next slide. Um, I will, you know, be a little humorous about this, but I, I do feel like the stomach is overrated. I feel like the pancreas really rules when it comes to digestion and absorption. Um, it really is critical in terms of digestion. It lies just beyond the stomach there and often is compared to um, a fish. I don't know what kind of fish that would be, whether it's a perch or a cod, or maybe in, in New England, we might refer to it as a cod. <laughs> Next slide, please. This um, slide, um, Maria, um, is so well il illustrated in terms of what pancreatic enzymes do. 
I have patients um, who are taking pancreatic enzymes and it, so commonly, you know, to hear them say, uh, what do these do again? How do they, how are they going to help me? But if you think about enzymes almost like scissors where they're cutting down, breaking down the food that we eat, which is, you know, a variety of proteins, fats, carbohydrates into smaller components, fatty acids, amino acids, glucose, um, so that we're more easily able to absorb it into the body. Why is that so important? Well, we'll talk about that in the next few slides, but if we didn't absorb a lot of these calories, of course, we probably would lose weight. Um, simply put, next slide. Insulin, different. Again, remember it's, it's, it's uh, the pancreas makes and produces insulin. And that insulin enables the glucose that's been broken down by enzymes um, to connect to receptors on cells uh, to then be used in the cell for energy. Next slide. This is a, a great animation um, that's, if you can go to the animated pancreas page, uh, patient, uh, Google that, it's through the National Pancreas Foundation. They, they offer some really good um, animated explanations of um, how the pancreas works, um, what is exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, um, so we thought we'd just put that on there as a resource for you. Next slide. So exocrine refers to enzyme production. So pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, you know, so not producing enough enzymes. Um, this can be seen at any point. Um, it is the first question or series of questions I ask patients when I first meet someone with pancreatic cancer. Um, and then ongoing, these are the same questions that I ask our patients throughout treatment. It can show up at diagnosis, during treatment, postoperatively, six months postoperatively, a year postoperatively. Um, and these are some of the signs and symptoms of what patients may experience if they don't have enough enzymes. So that indigestion or cramping associated with eating, a large amounts of gas, particularly malodor malodorous, floating stools, greasy fat stools, um, light colored, unexplained weight loss. Next slide. So do I need enzymes? You know, I'm looking at all of those signs and symptoms and thinking maybe they would be beneficial. Maybe it's something that I know that they're prescribed um, and as a dietitian's role, we certainly don't prescribe them in the United States, but we are um, actively involved in helping patients understand how to dose them, the timing, um, and why they're doing what they're doing. Um, these were some of the questions that Maria was able to glean from your questions that were posed before the presentation. So we're hoping that we can um, perhaps answer them in the next few slides. Next, please. This is a classic slide <laughs> that Maria put together years ago when we first started doing a lot of these presentations um, for PanCan. And, you know, you get patients who are just like, you know, I don't have diarrhea. I, I don't have malabsorption. I don't need enzymes. But I, it's really important to note that a fair amount of our patients with pancreatic cancer are on narcotics to control pain, of course, that lends more to constipation. And in fact, in that situation where maybe that patient does have malabsorption, does that actually balance the diarrhea so that that patient may then say, you know what, I have normal bowel function. I'm fine, I don't need enzymes. So really important to take into account. Um, and important, when I have patients that are feeling better and they're able to come off of their narcotics for pain, that all of a sudden they're experiencing more signs and symptoms like diarrhea that make us think that those patients would benefit from taking pancreatic enzymes. Next slide. So if you are taking enzymes, 
pancreatic enzymes, or it's felt that you needed them. And you're thinking, hey, these don't really work. You know, what's going on here? Um, here are a couple of tips um, in terms of optimizing them. Remember, um, patients are human. <laughs> they can forget to take them. Um, they can forget to take them. Maybe they, for they remember to take them at dinner, but they forget to take them at dessert. Or they think that taking what they need for dinner is going to help them with the dessert they eat an hour later. Um, as care providers, it's nice to be able to remind them to take their enzymes at the first bite and throughout the meal. So if you were taking three with a meal, you would take one at the first bite, another one in the middle, one at the end. If it's 15 minutes or greater after eating a meal, probably too late to take them, so it's okay. Um, no need to take them at that point. Sometimes just timing them, like I suggested, may be all that you need in terms of optimizing the enzymes. Remember to keep them in places that, um, you know, patients will keep them in their car, in their shirt pocket, in the purse, um, in several places so that they're not without them. Um, try not taking them at the same time as antacids or iron supplements. Sometimes acid reducing medications may help to activate the enzymes or make them um, work a little bit better. If patients are having a hard time taking them orally, um, you know, they're too large, um, easy enough to open the capsule, empty into something like applesauce or anything that's non-dairy, um, reminding patients not to chew them if they did this. And it may very well be that um, a patient's not on the right dose. Um, next slide, please. I can't tell you how many times I have patients who will say, yeah, Janine, um, I started on that dose they prescribed, it didn't work, so I just stopped taking them. Um, so next few slides, I'll sort of get into this, but the right enzyme and how much you take, especially how much you take may make a big difference in terms of troubleshooting. We start generally at a very low dose. When we look at meals, we're recommending 20 to 75,000 units of lipase. And you think, well, where the hell do I see lipase units on um, my enzymes? But look for them because enzymes are prescribed in various ways. Sometimes you might see an enzyme that only has 6,000 units of lipase. Other times there are larger capsules that might house 24,000 units of lipase in a single capsule. So really important to also know that everyone is different. You may compare notes with another care provider or another patient and say, well, um, yeah, I usually take two or three with a meal, but someone else may be taking five to six. So it depends on the amount of fat that's in a meal, the volume of a meal, um, and generally, um, if you are consuming something that has no fat in it, let's say an apple or a banana, um, really no need to take an enzyme with a snack if it has low fat or no fat. Next slide, please. So titration. Remember I was talking about, you know, starting at a low dose, and if that doesn't work, if the symptoms of insufficiency are still hanging out, we incrementally increase by one more capsule. Now, as patients are on enzymes, they learn to dose them. They learn to incrementally dose them. They're not afraid to do that as they're educated about enzymes. And then flexible dosing becomes part of the dialogue as well. So, Let's say your provider said, hey, you know, you should take three with a meal. And you're like, geez, you know, I remember that dietitian I heard talk about flexible dosing. So breakfast may be small and you may only need two. Whereas an evening meal, maybe the largest meal of the day, 
and where you're maybe consuming more fat and you might need three or four. Or let's say you went out to eat and you're eating foods that are maybe more rich and you might take, you know, five at that meal. I know it sounds crazy, but it happens. Um, or like I said about dessert, don't forget about dessert and snacks. Um, you know, you definitely should take an enzyme or two um, as well if, as if you were supplementing with homemade shakes or protein smoothies or some of the commercially available um, high calorie supplements, those have fat in them and you certainly want to take an enzyme with that. Um, I think probably, and um, thanks for, <laughs> Maria, you're starting to read my mind, um, advancing the slide. Um, I, I really do feel like probably the biggest issue with enzymes in, in my patients with pancreatic cancer, and I think Maria would probably agree, is that patients are afraid to dose up because nobody really told them to do that. Um, so, but I just wanted to know that it's safe to do it. There are upper limits. We um, usually will say a max daily dose of um, kilogram weight by 10,000. Uh, unit lipase units per day. So if you took someone who was 130 pounds or 60 kilograms, that means that they could take 48 capsules of Creon. Now, note I said Creon 12,000s. Well, if it was a Creon 24,000, that would be 24 capsules in a day. So that's a lot, you know, that's an upper limit. That's quite a lot. And most of my patients never get to that limit or they're afraid to, but with some encouragement, we're actually able to help patients get to the right dose. Next slide, please. Um, and, you know, I had a caregiver just told me the other day, um, you know, Janine, I, um, I read, the side effects on enzymes and I don't want my I don't want my husband taking them and actually she wouldn't let him take any more than one per meal and he was taking Creon 24. So um, we talked a little bit more about some of the side effects. I think most often what I see is constipation but but most of the time that's transient and we're able to offset that either through diet or with the addition of meds. Um, Really, really careful. I had another another instance, um, and I and I felt really awful. But one of our patients uh, decided to try enzymes. We felt like he he certainly had pancreatic insufficiency. He started the same day or day after he had his fulfurinox, and um, stayed on the enzymes for three or four days. He called me and said, "Oh my gosh, Janine." Those enzymes, they caused nausea, diarrhea. It was horrible. And, um, you know, it most likely, you know, probably uh, was it was probably because he's, his treatment was most like, likely contributing to those side effects. Um, so at some point, perhaps I might be able to get the patient to try it again. Well, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to some nutrition strategies for common symptoms and side effects. Um, we got questions such as, um, you know, what are some tips my, my, I'm taking care of my significant other and they complain about food tasting strange. Um, also a comment about food not sitting well. And I think that some of the, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of time on enzymes because that is just such an important part of side effect management with, with, um, this group of, of individuals. Um, and then somebody asked about what's the best diet to help gain weight, but also considering diabetes. So we're gonna touch on that a little bit here. Common side effects we get questions about are poor appetite, um, early satiety, so feeling full really quickly, um, nausea or vomiting, taste changes, changes in bowel movement such as diarrhea or constipation, feelings of excessive gas, how to deal with diabetes. Um, some of these, you, they're, you're, 
um, loved one may experience these on a cyclic nature. So they have a chemotherapy infusion and they experience nausea for three or four days after chemo. And then that gets better in between cycles. Um, diarrhea may be more of a problem um, earlier on after surgery or maybe cyclic with chemotherapy. Constipation may happen um, if you're utilizing more pain medicine at certain times of the day or, or certain, you know, certain days of the week or um, utilizing anti-nausea medications such as Zofran um, at certain days. So it's not, these are, these are not always constant, but they can be intermittent they can wax and wane and they can be related to where somebody is with, with their treatment or what their treatment modality is. So for poor appetite, um, some strategies are to, to eat small and serve small amounts or really snack size meals more often so that the total food volume through the day adds up to a more normal intake, but each of those individual meals are smaller. I was just on the phone with a caregiver yesterday who um, was telling me about um, how she's been serving on the largest dinner plate she can, but serving moderate size portions and how that's really helped her husband um, to eat more um, just because that visualization and that visual look of the meal is less daunting. It looks like a smaller amount served on that larger plate. The biggest thing that I can recommend <laughs> for caregivers is scheduling meals and snacks. So as caregivers, we can really, you know, food and, and nutrition are ways that we can really help support our, our loved ones. Um, but it can also be a point of, of stress and worry um, when we see that they're, not, that they're not eating very well or when they can't tell us what sounds good to them. So I really encourage that um, each evening you sit down and discuss the next day. What are the scheduled appointments for the next day? Um, do we have anybody coming over for home health the next day or visitors coming the next day and thinking about the time of those visits and then scheduling what time meals will be and what time snacks will be and actually going as far as deciding what that meal or snack will be. So when your loved one gets up and it's eight o'clock in the morning and it's time for breakfast and you say, Mary, what, what do you want for breakfast? And Mary says, oh, gosh, you know, Nothing sounds good to me today, but you planned the night before that you that Mary was going to have an, an egg and a piece of toast. So if nothing sounds good to Mary, then you just go ahead and fix that egg and piece of toast and you put it in front of her. Um, if, if Mary's having a great morning and she says, oh, you know, I love that wonderful oatmeal you make with the sliced bananas and the walnuts, then you go for it. Make what she wants. Once you put that food in front of your loved one, then your job is done. If you put a meal or if you put a snack in front of your loved one and they haven't been able to tell you what sounds good or they tell you they don't have an appetite, if you put that in front of them, that's one, two, three, five, or 10 bites more food than they would eat if, if they just said nothing sounds good. So really scheduling those meals and adhering to that, that schedule, but also knowing that, that once, you, once you've helped with that meal preparation um, or prompted that snack, then you can just back off and say, you know, you don't have to worry about pushing them to finish what's on the plate because that's more that they're gonna eat than they would have. Other tips when somebody has a poor appetite is to use liquid calories. So this is going to be things, this can be milk, this can be um, dairy alternatives like soy milk, rice milk, almond milk. This can be um, juice, so 100% juice. This can be sports drinks. And these can be supplement drinks, um, whether it's homemade or it's ready to drink. Um, those liquid calories can be a, a way to get those meals or snacks um, or, or get an ad additional meal or snack um, without really having to sit down to eat that. Light activity before meals is one thing that can be done to help stimulate the appetite. And if appetite's really a struggle, then really talking with your healthcare team about potentially um, if there might be a medication that could be prescribed that could help with appetite. 
So those liquid nutrition drinks um, that are commercially available, I've got some listed here. This of course is not an all-inclusive list. Um, I do really encourage to, that you take a look at, um, at the drink and kind of think about is the goal to replace a snack and replace a meal or is the goal to get more calories in or to get more protein in? A lot of the times these supplement drinks you'll find, um, a lot of commercially available supplement drinks are really focused on getting protein in, um, but they don't have much calorie, many calories to go along with that. So you may need more of a meal replacement drink to use as a snack versus a high protein drink. Also, homemade smoothies are good options, and this is where you can really get creative. Um, you just need a little liquid and maybe some, and something to thicken up, and then also making sure that you get a good protein. So liquid could be juice, yogurt, milk, soy milk, water, um, those things to thicken the smoothie. Most people use fruit. This is a good way to sneak vegetables in. You know, you can throw a, a big handful of spinach into a smoothie and, and generally it's hard to tell that it's there. Um, cooked vegetables, so something like cooked carrots or cooked squash, cooked sweet potato can also mix really nicely into a smoothie. And then making sure that you get a good source of protein. So that can be from food, that could be from tofu, from cottage cheese, from Greek yogurt, or it could be using a protein supplement like a protein powder. Early satiety, so this is feeling full really quickly. We can um, see this in patients who um, maybe have a tumor that's, that's um, pushing into, um, so it's narrowing the small, the, the passage where the food moves through the small intestine out of the stomach, or we might see this after somebody has had surgery. Um, but Tips for early satiety, same as kind of dealing with a poor appetite um, to some degree. It's those small frequent meals, um, but also if, if the stomach is slow to empty, then liquids are probably gonna empty a little bit better. Um, and preventing um, things that add more gas. So alleviating gas, alleviating bloating, avoiding um, carbonated beverages, avoiding drinking with a straw uh, so that you're not adding additional gas into the stomach. If somebody gets full really quickly, high fiber foods can actually um, make them feel full faster and can be slower to empty from the stomach. So we, we recommend kind of backing off those high fiber foods if they have a slow emptying stomach. If your loved one has been diagnosed with a partial obstruction or a partial blockage or that narrowing of the intestine, then it actually may be um, really for safety reasons that we would want to um, avoid high fiber foods. There are some medications for a stomach that is slow to empty. There are some medications that sometimes can be prescribed. Um, with any medication, they all have potential side effects or interactions with other medications. So we find in our clinic, you know, the doctors and the, the prescribers really like for us as dietitians to try and work on these food tips before they, they think of medication as the second step, not the first step to managing um, side effects such as poor appetite or early, or early satiety. Now, the exception to that is with nausea, and uh, an oncology dietitian will tell you first and foremost that nausea medication is really important and that our nutrition tips are second to that. So if somebody is having nausea, um, what we, we, again, going back, smaller, more frequent meals, so less of a load on the GI tract, but also trying to avoid um, foods that may be more, um, seasoned, so avoiding overly sweet foods, avoiding greasy or fried foods, anything that's really highly spiced, eliminating offending odors. So this may be um, that your loved one um, on a nice day sits outside and enjoys fresh air while you're cooking in the house because the cooking smells can, can bring up nausea. Or if you have a window in the kitchen, opening the window in the kitchen can be helpful. 
using cold foods or cold foods that are at room temperature can also eliminate those offending odors. Um, using good oral care is important and um, trying to eliminate stress as much as possible. And then hydration, and this, this is an overarching theme as well, is really working on staying hydrated. Um, instead of drinking uh, big, big cups of water all at one time, really sipping throughout the day, constantly keeping a bottle of water or a, a carton of a supplement drink or a, a glass of milk, something there with your loved one um, whether they're sitting in their favorite chair or if you're out for a walk, keeping keeping liquids on you at all times and really trying to sip, sip, sip throughout the day. Taste changes. So one of our participants asked a question about taste changes and we do have a lot of, of individuals who experience taste changes um, with one of the common chemotherapy regimens for pancreatic cancer. So the Fulfirinox regimen that involves oxaliplatin, um, that oxaliplatin can cause a metallic taste. Um, mm -hmm. Cisplatin is sometimes used in chemotherapy regimens for pancreatic cancer that can cause a metallic taste. So dealing with taste changes um, is common for a lot of individuals. One of the things that can be really important is rinsing the mouth. Um, if your mouth is, if you don't have any issues with mouth sores, then rinsing with a little water with lemon can be helpful to kind of perk those taste buds up. Otherwise, if somebody has mouth sores, mixing or rinsing with just water or water with baking soda can help cleanse the palate. Um, if some, if your mouth is in good shape, then using um, tart flavors, so things like lemons, pickles, vinegar, to help enhance the dull taste of foods um, or um, using foods that you don't have an expectation of what those foods are supposed to taste like. So if somebody's uh, dealing with taste changes, I often recommend, you know, try those foods that you haven't liked in the past. If yogurt was something that you've always steered away from that you didn't like, maybe that's something that you would like now. Or if you've never, if you've never tried, um, cottage cheese before, then try try that. Um, see what that new food tastes like. If um, there's some different seasonings or spices that you haven't liked or that your loved one hasn't tried before, um, those can be ways so that they, they can um, taste the food for what their ability to taste is at that time and not have that expectation of what it's supposed to taste like. Um, tastes can change. So something that works one week may not work another week. So continue to retry foods and can continue to go back to foods um, that haven't worked before. For the metallic taste, um, this can be a little harder to try and work around, but definitely avoiding introducing any more metal into the mouth. So if somebody's experiencing metallic taste, Using plastic utensils can be really helpful um, and avoiding um, food that is consumed or served out of a metal, metal container. So for example, if somebody's having some ginger ale to drink, um, pouring that into a glass rather than having them drink out of an aluminum can. Another big thing that's really um, important with taste changes, so there's good mouth care, but also um, because what I find is um, with my healthcare pr providers is we're really concentrated on, on you know, that abdomen that Janine showed at the beginning there. You know, our, our providers are really, really good at thinking about the pancreas and the stomach and the GI tract, but sometimes they forget to look at the mouth and thrush can be an issue. So take a look at your mouth. If you see changes or, or take a look at your, your loved one's mouth, if you see changes, if you see a white furry coating on the tongue, um, that's something to bring to the caregiver's attention because thrush can be responsible for taste changes. And if somebody has had a decrease in their immune system, whether it's a hit to the immune system by surgery, or if they've been on a, a lengthy course of antibiotics or multiple courses of antibiotics, um, or just simply a, a decrease in, in um, 
immune system with, with chemotherapy, that does give an opportunity for thrush to present. So really keeping an eye out for that. So um, sometimes, so we, we really um, spend a lot of time talking about enzymes because those are so critically important and so beneficial um, and really solve the diarrhea issue for a lot of people. But there can be many different causes of diarrhea. So some of, one of our participants wrote in and said, you know, my brother's been taking enzymes and, and they just really haven't worked. He still has a lot of diarrhea. Um, somebody else said, you know, what are some tips? What can I do for this chronic diarrhea? So if somebody is on enzymes, they've worked, they've, they've done that titration, those adjustments, that troubleshooting, spreading the enzymes through the meal, um, avoiding the antacids with, with the enzymes, increasing, decreasing the dose. If you've really worked on that with the enzymes and are still experiencing um, some diarrhea, other things could be contributing course, as Janine mentioned, um, the fulfurinox is, is um, notorious for contributing to diarrhea for a lot of patients. Um, but also lactose intolerance. Somebody that wasn't lactose intolerant before um, could become lactose intolerant. If somebody has had surgery, there's a possibility um, of, of bacteria growing in certain parts of the intestine that they don't normally grow or an overgrowth of bacteria. Um, if somebody's been on antibiotics or multiple courses of antibiotics, there's a risk of something called C. diff or Clostridium difficile, which is an overgrowth of a, of a bacteria. Um, also, if one has had surgery, um, whether it is a Whipple surgery or um, a, a bypass surgery for uh, a blocked intestine or a history of, of a GI surgery, um, when the stomach has been altered, patients can have something called dumping syndrome. And this is where the food empties very rapidly from the stomach. So working with your team, if chronic diarrhea is an issue, working with your team to try and get it at, at what might be the root or what multiple causes may all be contributing to each other and, and working on strategies that can help with that. So some nutrition strategies, regardless of the cause of diarrhea, um, some nutrition strategies are gonna be to reduce or avoid lactose in the diet, or if dairy products are a significant source of calories and protein for your loved one, um, utilizing lactase, which is, an, which is a, in the United States, this is an over-the-counter um, enzyme that helps break down, helps specifically to break down the, the lactose in dairy. Um, this would be supplemented in addition to pancreatic enzymes. This is not something that is part of, of pancreatic enzymes. If somebody is experiencing diarrhea, then we want to reduce insoluble fiber in the diet. This is what some of us think of as roughage. So this would be reducing or avoiding foods like bran cereals or whole wheat um, whole grain um, cereals, whole grain bread, things that are made with whole oats, or, or excuse me, things that are made with whole wheat um, may need to be reduced during the time of, of the diarrhea episodes. Foods that are sweetened with sugar substitutes, especially sugar alcohols, and foods that are sweetened with a lot of sugar can contribute to diarrhea. So really reducing um, or eliminating those foods from the diet, especially when somebody's having a, a lot of diarrhea. But things that you can provide more of or things to do more of are gonna be to increase the soluble fiber foods, the sources of soluble fiber in the diet. So this soluble fiber works kind of like a sponge and it absorbs um, extra fluid from, from the gut and it helps gel, the, gel that extra fluid. So there are some foods that are high in soluble fiber. Most of the, the foods most commonly um, are going to be bananas, the inside of the apple, so the apple meal. So apple without the peel or apple that's been cooked without the peel, so applesauce. But being sure with something like applesauce that that's not sweetened with added sugar. Um, also, oats are a good source of soluble fiber. So um, oatmeal or something that's made with whole oats, like Cheerios, could be an option 
We do want to stay away from that, the whole wheat foods, but the whole oats, the foods made with whole oat fiber could be helpful. Barley is another good source of soluble fiber. And then again, making sure um, that you are staying well hydrated. So generally I recommend a cup of fluid, an additional cup of fluid for every one loose bowel movement. And it might be helpful if you're having, or if your loved one is having multiple loose bowel movements a day to utilize an electrolyte containing um, fluid. So this could be something like a Pedialyte um, or a Ceralite drip drop. So these are going to be more oral rehydration solutions that have a good, uh, a good electrolyte um, and carbohydrate balance, or it might be utilizing a sports drink like um, Gatorade. A lot of sports drinks are too high in sugar. We need a little bit of sugar to help with the electrolyte absorption. Um, so in the United States, we use G2. So it's a lower sugar, but a higher electrolyte um, concentration. Another option is just to take regular Gatorade or regular Powerade and, and cut it in half with water. So half water and half uh, regular Gatorade. If somebody has lactose intolerance, I touched on this about um, limiting the lactose containing foods or instead providing the lactase enzymes. With dumping symptoms. So if somebody's had an operation on their stomach, bypass surgery or um, part of their stomach removed as part of a Whipple surgery, um, dumping, classic symptoms of dumping are um, flushing, sweating, or feeling of low blood sugar, or having an urgent loose bowel movement, typically occurring within two hours, uh, generally occurring within two hours of eating, typically occurring within about 30 minutes of eating. I have had some patients that have flushing, sweating, and feelings of low blood sugar, but they don't have the loose bowel movement. Most patients, however, have that urgent loose bowel movement within about 30 minutes of eating. So keeping in mind that it's not an all or none thing, it could be one or two of these symptoms. But if something, somebody has dumping, things that can make dumping worse, so we, we wanna do the opposite of those things. So uh, to help with preventing dumping, we wanna eat small frequent meals or, or snack size meals, so limiting portion sizes limiting liquids um, with meals. So really trying to minimize fluid intake at meal and snack times and really drink those fluids in between. Um, trying to just use sips of liquid to get the meal down um, and, and avoid any excess fluid intake. Foods that are really high in sugar will actually empty more rapidly from the stomach. So avoiding those foods that are high in sugar and then avoiding hot liquids. Hot liquids, the heat stimulates the GI tract to move. So trying to avoid those hot liquids as much as possible to prevent dumping episodes. Uh, and utilizing um, some of those higher soluble fiber foods that, that I listed talking a, a few slides ago with talking about um, strategies for dealing with, with diarrhea. There are a couple studies on dumping syndrome that have actually had um, individuals benefit from using a powdered soluble fiber supplement along with their meal. So I really encourage if, if you suspect that your loved one has, is having dumping episodes to really work with your healthcare team about what strategies may be helpful in addition to these um, adjustments to meals. So the flip side of diarrhea um, can be constipation. And some, some individuals will have constipation and a few days later have diarrhea and can have a ping pong effect back and forth. But if constipation is, is, a, a, um, is an issue related to using pain medications or constipation is cyclic related to the use of Zofran or related to a certain chemotherapy cycle, 
um, than a bowel regimen using a laxative um, and or a stool softener combination or even a combination of laxatives may really be helpful, especially uh, with, with um, regular use of, of pain medication or regular use of um, anti-nausea medication like Zofran. Um, those, it may just be that hand in hand on a day that, that my um, loved one takes um, Norco, they also take a stool softener and laxative combination. We just do those together. Um, as I said in the previous slide, hot fluids can actually stimulate the GI tract to move, so we want to avoid those in situations of dumping. But for somebody that's constipated, drinking hot fluids can help stimulate the gut. So um, some of us may have the, the effect of coffee. So a lot of individuals may start their day with a cup of coffee and find that they have a bowel movement 30 minutes later. Um, this can be any of us. But for somebody that has constipation, really taking advantage of, of, of that um, trait of a hot coffee or a hot cup of tea can help keep the bowels moving regularly. Just like hydration is important for, for um, diarrhea um, and for nausea, const for constipation, hydration is important as well. So if we're thinking about overarching things and overarching themes um, that we as caregivers can help our, our loved ones with, staying hydrated is really, really important. It's really important if you're going to utilize higher fiber foods or fiber supplements to help with constipation that your loved one is well hydrated um, before you start making increases in fiber or adding fiber supplements to help with constipation. So hydration, hydration, hydration. Um, cannot stress it enough. If somebody is feeling full really quickly, it, we don't want to create excessive gas in the, in the GI tract. If um, somebody just in general is feeling really gassy, they've optimized their enzymes, but they still have a lot of gas, there's a lot of things that we can do to help with that. So first is thinking about what foods cause gas. So typically our cabbage family of vegetables, so thinking about broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, those can be very gas producing for, for a lot of individuals. Some people may have gas with one of these vegetables, but not with another. So really honing in on that. Um, onions and beans are also very notorious for causing, um, for causing gas. So if somebody's already experiencing a lot of excessive gas, then we may want to um, really eliminate these foods from the diet for a period of time. Carbonated beverages, of course, those introduce more gas into the system and not forgetting that beer is a carbonated be beverage. So not just our sodas, um, but, but beer is also carbonated. So avoiding these in the diet if somebody experiences excessive gas. Things like drinking through a straw and chewing gum actually cause us to swallow more air. So eliminating those um, behaviors can help with reducing excessive gas. And then um, treating with semethicone or gas X. So one of our um, participants today commented about um, helping by giving their um, husband or brother um, gas X to help with the excessive gas. And um, one of the things that I tell patients is there's really been, you know, unlike a lot of medications um, that all have, have a maximum dose and, and Semethicone, there's really not been any, any studies that have been um, reported or produced that have actually sh shown um, that a maximum dose for semethicone. So legally, they have to put on the package to avoid taking um, a certain, more than a certain amount of gas X, but it um, may be helpful to take more than what um, those package limits are. So working with your healthcare provider to, if, you, if you're taking, um, you know, in the U.S., we think about um, we use Gas X Ultra. If and the package says take no more than four in a day, um, I really regularly will have patients take double that. So, working with your healthcare provider about um, you know if, if I'm 
currently giving my loved one this amount, can we go up from there? And then Bino um, is another enzyme that's not part of pancreatic enzymes, but this is an enzyme that specifically helps with breaking down plant fibers. And this can work on um, plant fibers in things like broccoli and cabbage, not just in beans. So that can be something to be, um, that could be helpful to take in addition um, to Creon or in addition to um, lactase pills. Um, these are enzymes that are just not included in that standard pancreatic enzyme um, pill. Um, moving along to, to glucose intolerance or diabetes. So patients who have pancreatic cancer um, may arrive at this diagnosis of diabetes different ways. It could be that somebody has had diabetes for um, many, many years in their life. Um, it could be that they were just diagnosed with diabetes a few months before the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. Or it may be that they had surgery that removed part or all of their pancreas and that has caused them to be a diabetic. So there are many different ways that somebody um, could become diabetic, but our management of that diabetes um, is going to be pretty much the same regardless of, of how that, um, how, what the cause of the diabetes was. With someone who is struggling with side effects of treatment, struggling with eating, um, struggling with weight loss, Typically, we're gonna to wanna to be more aggressive with medication or insulin and working closely with um, our healthcare providers. Oftentimes for individuals with pancreatic cancer or with diabetes due to pancreatic cancer or, or surgery, um, I find that utilizing the services of an endocrinologist, so somebody who specializes in diabetes, specializes in care of <laughs> endocrine system of the pancreas, um, that can really be helpful. So if you're finding that you're having difficulty with blood sugar management or, or aggressive medication, um, you have somebody that's, that's not comfortable with aggressive um, use of medication or insulin, uh, such as a general practitioner, a family practitioner, then maybe really um, turning to a, a specialist in diabetes and endocrinologist or um, getting treatment through a diabetes center could be really, really helpful. Um, in general, if somebody is able to maintain weight, um, is not having a lot of significant side effects that are interfering with treatment um, or interfering with, with eating, um, then we would encourage individuals to eat less refined carbohydrate, eat less added sugar in the diet. But if somebody's really struggling with eating, then we are going to be less restrictive on the diet and we want to use medication or insulin to help with the blood sugar control. So it's really something that needs to be customized from one, one individual to another. Um, eating carbohydrates in combination with protein, fiber, and fat can help keep the blood sugars from rising as high as quickly. Um, so rather than just eating a piece of fruit by itself, eating that fruit with peanut butter um, or eating it rather than having a few crackers by themselves, having some crackers and cheese, that can help blunt the effects of that carbohydrate in entry into the bloodstream. For those who are, um, have completed treatment, who have had surgery, who um, are um, considered, uh, who are disease free um, and are um, not dealing with side effects of treatment or side effects of surgery, then diet can become more, can play more of a role and we can use carbohydrate control or carbohydrate counting um, as more of a role and to and utilize the diet to play more of a role in diabetes management. Um, but we only want to do that if we are really um, well controlled, um, weight is well stabilized and, and not getting any treatment that can interfere with eating.
Uh, we see a fair amount of patients postoperatively from Whipple or pancreatectomy, not total. I see patients with total pancreatectomy too, but if I'm just talking about patients post-op Whipple um, who are on enzymes, you know, out the door from the hospital, their first question when I call them is, hey, how long do I have to be on these enzymes? <laughs> so, um, because it's not pleasant taking them. I hear that from patients. Um, having to take them every time you eat. Um, so um, patients, um, uh, we usually, um, I think the consensus is uh, to um, patients that should remain on enzymes for six months postoperatively, at least six months. Um, I do have patients that want to trial off of them and I will advise very carefully, like Maria is saying, that you can have mild insufficiency even moderate and not show these blatant signs, patients sort of just brush it off as, oh, that was Whipple. Um, and then you can run in, into troubles with um, vitamin deficiencies like vitamin A, D, because we're worried about long-term you know, um, bone growth or bone health. Um, and more often, we seem to be running into the problem of iron deficiency after Whipple because the small, the first part of the small bowel is removed and, and that's where iron absorption can take place. So um, like Maria is saying, it's really important in these patients that someone, whether it's the oncologist or primary care, is monitoring these levels um, annually. Um, usually we'll check nine months, nine months, six months after Whipple, but um, and I think that out of uh, Maria, I don't know if we're going to be able to, yeah, I, I, because I know we're running out of time. Um, and I'm glad we have the slides to provide, but um, these are some of the levels that we do check for postoperatively, um, along with vitamin A and E. These are some of the fat, fat soluble vitamins. Um, we check for ferritin, which is one of the indicators for iron deficiency, as well as an iron panel. Um, and uh, Maria is a co-author of a really important pa paper looking at um, survivorship in post-op surgery patients um, with pancreatic disease. So if you can PubMed that or Google that, it's a very great, it's a wonderful paper. Um, and then Maria, I don't know, um, maybe the, the one slide that I did wanna bring up, I don't know how much time we have, but um, the, the dietary supplements, that's sort of, a, that's sort of uh, another talk on of its own um, in providing some advisement um, because we're always very open to hear about what patients are taking for supplements, but um, I always like to sit down and get that list from patients in terms of what they're taking and why and how long. Sometimes you'll have patients taking supplements because they were just diagnosed. Other times these patients have been on supplements for years. Um, sometimes those patients are the ones that have stopped taking them at diagnosis because they're eating so poorly, some of them, and so they're just concentrating on getting calories in. Sometimes it's interesting to hear what care providers, what their wishes are. Uh, sometimes I hear most often, you know, that they want them to remain on supplements, and sometimes it's really hard for patients to get a number of supplements in in a day when they feel full quickly, when they can't eat calories. Um, but just some things just to be, you know, be very cautious of, you know, that just because it's a, a supplement or herbal based or plant based doesn't mean that it might not be harmful, especially in that a lot of these things, most of these things are not even standardized and there can be some false claims and that are very seductive and luring in patients because, of course, you want to do everything you can possibly do for yourself. Um, but there are supplements that can interact with other supplements or some of the medications that you're taking or even the chemotherapy that you're taking. So really, really, really important to have that conversation with your team, present what you're taking, become educated about what you're taking. A lot of my patients, you know, they'll, be, they'll take supplements, but they don't always necessarily know how much or why they're taking it. Um, but there are some concerns in terms of some of these supplements um, can be um, naturally anticoagulants. They can um, have impact on blood pressure, on glycemic control or blood sugar control. Um, 
and so I um, think that's probably a, as much as I can say about that in terms of the time limits on here. Um, these are some really great um, supplement the resources. Um, Memorial Sloan Kettering has an excellent website dedicated to um, herbal searches. Um, the U.S. Pharmacopoeia is the USP symbol you see there at the far right hand corner. And it's um, it sort of advises on drug standards that are, are enforceable in the United States by the FDA. Standards are also used in about over 140 countries. So it's that symbol that we look for and, in terms of supplements. And then um, I do want to put in a plug for, um, I think it's the sugar slide, Maria. Um, because without going into do too much detail, I want to recommend that you go to AICR.org. It's uh, got a really great explanation on sugar and the cancer connection. There's even like a YouTube of um, Alice Bender, who's a dietitian for that organization, sort of providing a really excellent explanation for that. Um, I never want our patients to feel guilty or anxious about what they're eating. And unfortunately, um, sugar feeds cancer can be very, um, um, uh, um, a little vicious in that regard. And, and I just, uh, it's always about what we can add to the diet versus taking away. Maybe that's probably the best said that I can say at this point, but um, these are some of the cookbooks and other resources that are out there. Rebecca Katz is a um, wonderful um, cookbook author. She's got something called the Culinary RX. It's a small booklet. You might be able to, I'm not sure if you could go onto her website and look for that, but we have those stashed in our cancer center.